you know, strengthening and promoting science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM education, is critical to move Middle Tennessee forward. A report released this year by the Department of Commerce as part of the America Competes Reauthorization Act underscored the importance of education in STEM fields. For instance, STEM workers typically earn 26% more than those in non-STEM positions. And women in STEM occupations earn 33% more than comparable women in non-STEM jobs. Business leaders in our communities understand that excellent public school systems, along with a strong STEM focus, will drive the future prosperity of our region. So our hope today is to bring together business and educational leaders to discuss STEM programs and policies that will continue to promote prosperity for the future generations of Middle Tennessee. Career fields within science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, as Vicki mentioned, are, are critical to our success. And it's been, been reported that of the top 30 growing careers, just about all of them require some STEM background. Those are the ones that are going to drive our economy. Opportunities like today give us a chance to hear from firsthand from experts and develop new relationships like with others dedicated to giving students the best chance to succeed. It is my pleasure to welcome one of those experts today, Dr. Jesse Register, Director of the Metropolitan National Public Schools. I would like to welcome all of you this morning. Thank you very much, Eric. And I want to say a word about Altria and Eric and the great support they give for public education here in our area. They're, they're wonderful partners. And I also want to recognize the other partners and sponsors who are uh, uh, causing this event to happen today, uh, along with Altria. Um, the Lipscomb University people and the uh, Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, they continue to be uh, great support and partners for us as we uh, go about public education in our community. It is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome to the podium our keynote speaker, David Burns. We, myself specifically, honored to be here. Uh, we're, we're honored to be a part of what is being built here in Tennessee, which is the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network, which Nashville is certainly the anchor, one of the anchors of, and probably the, the, the first platform school along with Nashville with the first hub. So just to give you a little bit of background, this was a good idea about three years ago and it was a speck on a piece of paper. And today I'm standing in front of 120 some people who are gathered together to talk about STEM education, which is the driving force behind the network. So thank you for being here. Because this is a very important conversation to have. One thing the director of the hub, Vicki Metzger, asked me to do was give you the dire statistics, and I'm going to do that. I apologize, so my, my job is to depress you from the beginning, and then we'll move on from there. But I'm going to touch on something Dr. Register mentioned. Um, I worked in the business field, and we like to use business as one word as if it, it encompasses all businesses. When they, they all look different, they all are different, they all have different needs. But in the public-private side, on the private side, what I was running into were a lot of kids who were extremely intelligent, who did not have a degree, sometimes did not have a high school diploma, sometimes just had fallen out of the system, and I was wondering where the disconnect was. I was working with kids who could calculate 15% of any number in a heartbeat and couldn't pass remedial math in school. I was working with kids who could fish and catch a largemouth bass at any time of the day because they knew the flora, the fauna, the moon, the cycles, and everything else, but couldn't do a bit of good in biology. And I was wondering where the disconnect was. How, are, how is there this group of people who are really, really smart not making it through the system? And I was honored to, uh, 
this is the, the technical term, I was allowed to blow up high schools in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> it was a great honor to have that opportunity, but we were looking at schools that had 14, 15, and 16 percent graduation rates. The opportunity for me was I could screw up and do better than that. Uh, the, the, the bar was so low that it really didn't matter. And unfortunately, nobody was paying attention to those schools. It was fortunate for me because we could do anything we wanted and we got away with it. But what we did was blow up the curriculum and make the 11th and 12th grade relevant, which is very similar to what's going on here in Nashville. Kids want to know why they're going to school. Kids want to be engaged. And kids are smart in many different ways. It's our job as the adults to figure out how they're smart. One of the big things that, that Dr. Wadsworth says is, um, you know, when we talk about just STEM gradu graduates, we're kind of disconnecting between half of the people that work for Battelle Memorial Institute. We've got about 40,000 worldwide. He says, we have accountants, we have lawyers, we have all kinds of people who are not specifically in the STEM field, but we want those people to have a strong depth of knowledge of science, technology, engineering, and math, even if they're not a scientist. A STEM graduate in our world is somebody who can problem solve, critically think, and be able to do the things that business wants them to do, which is work on your feet, be able to communicate in a decent way, and be able to write a memo. <laughs> We like to say that we're, we're promoting science, technology, and engineering and math. Our STEM schools are important. They are the critical piece of this. But our graduates from our high schools pursue multiple fields. We just hope that they f <laughs> pursue the STEM careers more than the national average, which we're finding out that they do, because the interest is there. Twelfth grade, 17% of students are proficient and interested, and women are underrepresented. Our work specifically in the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network and in the Ohio STEM Learning Network is in the ninth to 12th grades usually. What we find out is that is a little too late. We always ask our principals to start these schools and grow from ninth grade to 10th grade to 11th grade to 12th grade and the principals always want to grow from the ninth grade to the eighth grade to the seventh grade to the sixth grade. And I'm scared our pipeline is going to start at the wound at a certain point, but we're, the, the idea is you can't get them early enough to be able to ensure that they have the, the, the capacity necessary. All of our post-secondary friends that are in this room will tell us we spend way too much money on remediation, that kids come into the colleges unprepared for the rigors of post-secondary. Our ninth grade teachers will tell you the exact same thing. And I'm pretty sure our sixth grade teachers will tell you the exact same thing. So it's a whole pipeline issue. Too many statistics talk about literacy at the fourth grade level as too much of an indicator. Not too much. It is the indicator. But you can tell if a kid's not on grade level by reading in the fourth grade. We got problems, and we got problems for a long time. And we're going to spend a lot of money on remediation. Many are STEM interested. But they're not proficient. Uh, I stand in front of you as an English major. <laughs> and there's a reason I'm an English major, because I couldn't do math. <laughs> so we had to find a way around that. The push here is to ensure that all people, all students, have the basic capabilities to be able to perform. You've all been, especially those who are in STEM fields, in the room where the professor says, look to the right, look to the left, look in front of you, and one of these people are going to be gone by the time. That was great for 1957, because we could afford that kind of process of elimination. We can no longer afford that. Having people pushed out of the program is a big concern. <coughs> Making it so hard, and I'm not trying to say discontinue the rigor, but our job has shifted from making the rigor here and seeing who falls out to making sure that all the kids make it past the bar. So we've changed a dynamic here because we have kids who are interested in these fields and basically we need it for economic development for the country. About half the STEM graduates and only half college graduates 
choose to work in STEM careers. The, the good thing about working in STEM education is it becomes bipartisan pretty quick. I have lived through Democrat, Republican, and now Republican again in the state of Ohio gubernatorial leadership. Every two years, the governor will come out with a report and says, for economic development, we need more scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematics. It crosses both sides. So the job to the education system is how do you produce more? This is a slide that I show my kids. If you want to go into farming, fishing, there's 40, or forestry, there's 48 applicants for every job. The STEM careers at the bottom, you have a better chance. The job opportunities are there. All of the statistics tell us if you're a minority, if you're a woman, and you want to pursue a field in the, the STEM careers, it's a pretty good shot that you're going to have a pretty good career. So n why not look at that direction when you're talking about the career piece of it? Tennessee is just like the state of Ohio, and, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network was birthed out of Tennessee's Race to the Top, which was birthed out of Governor Bredesen. He was campaigning in the state of Ohio for Obama when he looked around and he said, this looks a lot like Tennessee. That's why this partnership was born. We have the same issues. We have the same concerns. We decided to work together as two states as opposed to you do your thing and we do our thing. <coughs> Tennessee has established the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network. The little stars represent where the hubs are. We, this is a hub gathering, the first annual STEMposium. We hope that this will continue for years to come. In Ohio, we're in our seventh year. And every year, this room grows because the need continues to grow. The solution hasn't been there. The Tennessee's uh, mission is to promote and expand the teaching of science, technology, and engineering, and math in K-12. It's actually to engage kids differently. It's actually a different way to get more kids into the pipeline interested in these fields, to bring them to the fire, finer higher education institutions that we do have in Tennessee. We have diversity in hubs, some located urban, some located rural in Tennessee. Our biggest challenge in Ohio, and I believe the Tennessee challenge will be the same, how do you get high quality STEM education into the rural areas? How do you get capacity where there is none? In Ohio, our hubs sit in places like Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, and Akron. Why do they sit there? Because you have STEM resources. You have the University of Cincinnati, the Ohio State University, Battelle Memorial Institute, Procter & Gamble, General Electric. You have those places located in urban centers. So it's natural that they were attracted. The same is being true, uh, being held true here in Tennessee. The challenge is how do you move into the rural areas? We are hoping Tennessee helps Ohio solve that problem. We are actually looking to you because we've had five years to work on it and we still don't have it done. Obviously, one of the components is going to be a virtual piece. Technology is a part of it. Uh, as Dr. Register mentioned, one of our schools, Metro, in Columbus is right now teaching kids in South Dakota. We think that's an interesting model, but we don't know if we can bring that to capacity. Tennessee and Ohio are not the only two states that are interested in this. There are 14 states across the country who are not getting any kind of funding who raised their hand and said, let's join together. The reason is we think if all of us work on it, maybe one of us will come up with a solution. What are the problems that we're working on? STEM capacity, meaning do you have the highly qualified science, te technology, engineering, and math teaching in a K-12? Do you have the interest? Can you engage kids in a different way? Can you measure differently? Is every kid that's going to go through one of the STEM schools going to be judged just solely on an ACT or a state test? How do you grade performance-based assessments? How do post-secondary institutions actually accept performance-based assessments? How do you do credit differently? 
Uh, one of the interesting conversations we've had with Dr. Steele, or Jay Steele, um, here is around early college. Some of our kids are actually ready to attend post-secondary institutions by the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Some are not. As I said, uh, as a parent, I got a daughter, I did not want her on a campus. I still don't want her on a campus, but that's a whole different. Uh, the, it's an emotional maturity and a academic maturity. But if our kids are ready, why are we holding them back? And what kind of policies, funding formulas need to be in place to ensure that that can happen? As a parent, if you can get two years of college knocked off while they're in the 11th and 12th grade, why wouldn't you want that? As a policymaker, right now we pay K-12, specifically in Ohio, for a high school diploma. If the school is now producing an associate degree, they're producing a different result. So I have to pay differently. It, there is a different funding formula that's there. The reason I bring this one up is 14 states are interested in this kind of conversation. 14 states are interested in having the policies that allow these things to happen and to drive state policy. Business can help us advocate for this because you want them better, faster, and cheaper too. We want to get them through better, faster, and cheaper. This whole slide is around just trying to do different things. We are a different kind of an association network or however because we actually have teachers on the ground. You have teachers every day that are working in schools that should be helping inform what the policies are, what the barriers are. How do we make good things happen for kids? For associations to have the student voice, the teacher voice, the principal leadership voice, the district voice is critical to making good policy. Tennessee has charged the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network with creating a strategic plan that is for the state of Tennessee and done with partnership with the Tennessee Department of Education. Basically asking the questions that you're going to be asking here today. Do you have the workforce that is sufficient? How do you do things differently to get the kids through the system better and faster and cheaper? And will Tennessee be, have the workforce necessary for economic growth over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? The push is to have, ensure that the students of Tennessee are well positioned for the future. The push is to make sure that all kids are STEM literate and capable to move on. It's a coordination of economic policies. In the introduction, I've lived in the world of education and I've lived in the world of workforce development, never the two shall meet. And by the way, both sides think the other side is crazy. And they are. <laughs> education has a responsibility to teach all kids, specifically in the K-12. That is part of the deal. Business has the responsibility to say these skills have changed, the demand is higher. The question is, can the two parties work together for a better response? Patel has created each one of these networks with one guiding principle, that business, post-secondary, and K-12 have to sit at the same table. They have to have the same kind of conversations. You and I know that STEM schools could be the flavor of the month, and could be in two years never talked about again. The push is having business sitting at the table to ensure that that doesn't happen. The push is to have post-secondary sitting at the table to recreate those courses that are necessary for kids to be successful. The point is to have K-12 at the table to ensure that the kids make it through the pipeline completely. All equal partners. The blame game isn't helping anyone at this point. Expand access. This is the trickiest part. We all have a great math teacher somewhere. We all have a great English teacher somewhere. How do you ensure that all kids have the great teacher? I've read too many statistics that a kid born in poverty has like a 1 in 16 chance of having one good math teacher through their whole K-12. 
it's what we're hoping to do is there is going to be five great STEM schools. And there's, to be very honest with you, the, Jay may disagree with this, but these schools are pretty easy to staff. People want to work in this kind of environment. Our Dayton school, we had a literature, uh, we had an English position, 376 applications for one English teaching. Why? Because it's a nice environment to work. It's a creative place to be. Our job is to keep that small so we can keep that quality, but how do we get that quality past a school that only has 400 kids? How do we have this small school have a big imprint? That's part of the, the goals of the strategic plan, creating that access. Reduce the gap. The best thing about these STEM hubs here in Tennessee is their post-secondary partners are sitting at the table it is not an accusation to them, but how do you have to do things differently? Because you're gonna have a different kind of graduate walk out of these schools, and they're going to expect more. It has been heartwarming to me to see that Ohio State has changed policy. Ohio State has changed the kind of teachers that actually they have at the entry level position, or at the entry level classes that STEM graduates have. We hope that that manifests in Tennessee as well. They're retaining more of the STEM kids to reduce that deficit. Building community awareness. This is probably where this group and this room has the, the biggest stake in the game. I'm not, um, I can only ask Procter & Gamble to do so many things to help us. I can only ask General Electric to do so many things. So when I ask them, they have to have something to do and it has to be tangible and they have to be able to move and next week they have to be able to forget about it. That's my obligation of the partner is to make sure that it's meaningful. This partnership, if, if your businesses get down to writing curriculum, that's a difficult thing to do and you don't really want to be in that position. Curriculum lives in the experts world, in post-secondary world. The results, defining the results, providing the internships, and providing the community awareness is a good place for business and education. And that is not to say that business's job is just to cheer education on. You are supposed to be our thorny side. You are supposed to say, your kids are not doing this, I need them to do that. And I need it this way. Give us the problem to work on to create a real partnership. If a year from now you are meeting and everything's friendly, you don't have a real partnership. These STEM innovation networks actually work. We, we do benefit from six to seven years in the state of Ohio. Um, I'll give you one little touching story because I am an educator. We had one kid uh, graduate from the Cleveland MC Squared model this year. He was awarded the Gates Millennial Scholarship. And what that is, is undergraduate, graduate, doctoral, covered, plus a stipend. Covered. Forever. To any Ivy League school, the kid was accepted into any Ivy League school, Stanford, it, I mean, I went home and smacked my kids after I got to, <laughs> you just are not. This kid was a homeless kid in the streets of Cleveland. This kid actually lived with the principal of the school. So do I know that we make a difference? Yeah. If you want to get to the data, I can show you our five, which is now 10 schools. We're all outperforming the state, but we should outperform the state. That's, you know, that's kind of was accepted. One interesting thing in Ohio is they're pushing, of course, everybody for the Common Core. Algebra 2 becomes a benchmark in mathematics. Our STEM schools are saying, no, it's calculus. And that's exactly where they should be. They should be not doing the best, they should be doing two steps past the best. One other thing I would encourage you, allow these schools to have some failures. We are, Battelle's a research and development company, 99.9% .9 of our experiments fail. 
That's just standard operating procedure. The schools, and specifically the platform schools, were designed to try something different. And it's okay if it doesn't work, because we'll just do it again tomorrow in a different way. But to create that space where we can move beyond the minimum expectations, and how do you get kids calculus at a college level, in a STEM field, in their 10th grade year, give them space. Because they need that to figure out it for everybody else. Thank you. So the next part of our program is going to feature a panel of local business and education leaders. The panelists are going to provide us with a brief overview of the STEM initiatives in their communities, what they have learned about the process of collaboration, and offer helpful tips to improve our local STEM efforts. So the first question I'm going to throw out to you is how would you describe your partnerships if you're a business with schools, if you're a school with business, how would you describe your partnership, your work with those partners um, as a local STEM school or cluster? How do you describe your partnership? We actually have a great two-way partnership working with the teachers. So we, um, in the elementary school at Hattie Cotton, we actually have a scientist per grade level who goes in one day a week and works with the teachers. So in addition to that scientist bringing content knowledge that maybe those elementary teachers um, would not have from their educational background. Um, our scientists also have a wonderful opportunity to learn from really great teachers. Um, we also do this in middle school. Each science teacher has a scientist that works with them one day a week. Um, and we really focus on bringing in that, that hands-on um, component, which is sometimes hard for teachers to get to on their own. If you have a class of, you know, 28, 30 kids, um, to do hands-on, one-on-one can sometimes be difficult. So having that scientist, I think, really helps the teachers um, to feel comfortable doing that. And then they also kind of feel like they have an expert. Um, and and the, the kids look forward to the scientists. We notice that um, attendance is better on the day that the scientist is supposed to be there. And then at the high school level, we've actually worked with the teachers at Stratford High School um, to develop our curriculum that we teach in the interdisciplinary science and research programs. So we're really drawing from the teacher's experience with curriculum because we are primarily scientists and not educators. Um, and so we kind of take, hey, we have this really cool idea. And the teachers are like, yeah, let's see how we can figure out how we can make that work um, in a real school setting, um, but still, you know, maintaining something that is is unique and different for those students. Our other panelists, how are you? you go ahead, and I'll. I'd like to speak from the business perspective of that. We've partnered with Union and have been a partner for I think six years now. And for us, we we were excited about jumping into that concept because we're an industry that's directly affected by that STEM initiative. We, we all know culturally, economically, we have people coming out of high school who can't balance a checkbook, who can't do simple mathematics, don't understand a budget, don't understand the difference between simple wants and needs. And because Union is an elementary school, it was an opportunity for us to start at the ground level. So we've, we've worked with Union specifically to um, involve the students. We have student savers and student bankers. So the bankers actually are the ones who count the money, how, help the students with that process so that they understand the concepts. But then the student savers are also um, learning how to save and wants and needs and getting them excited. So we've helped in the classroom that way. We've taught one-on-one um, -on -one and different in different classrooms to understand mathematics and to embrace that and to, to gear them toward the future. And it, I think as a, as a business, we're a, a local community bank, it's, it's an uh, exciting opportunity and just to be asked to be involved has been a big deal for us and been thrilled to, to connect. I think as educators, our, our plate is full. And so when we have people who just want to drop in on engineering day, that was difficult for us because we say it, it may not fit within the curriculum. So I think in, in our world, we have to make sure that we're very strategic in what we're asking for from the businesses. And so that's what we did. We were very specific when, when we asked, not only the businesses, but also our, our Austin Peay State University. So when I went to Mr. Barty, Dale Rudolph, our science consulting teacher, already had the, the standards aligned exactly in biology on what they're going to be teaching so that when, when he works 
hurts his work, we know where it fits, and the teachers know where it fits. So when those students experience it, the teachers are experiencing it also. So they know how to put it back into the curriculum. When we go to Austin P, just like you said earlier, they, we need to know the content that the teachers don't know. They can be our experts in that content. So we, we went to... Um, we want to do externships, but you got to be specific on what you want with the externships. Those businesses need to know what to expect when teachers go out there. And the teachers need to know what is the expectation when you go out there when you come back. It's not that you just learn what you learned during the summer. It's that you bring back those experiences and you stay connected to that business for the entire year. And so those expectations were laid. We did a lot of debriefing, what worked, what didn't work with them. Uh, when, when we met and talked about what we were going to do, I, I got real excited. So that was the way we challenged right. the STEM students. What are you going to do to help us feed the world in 2050? And what ethical decisions will you have to make along the way? So this is why I think ag fits with STEM, because we can challenge those young people who are brilliant. And it's so impressive to watch them. I and mean, we did a lot of things, stuff I never thought I would see young ladies do, like artificial insemination of a cow, looking at, at the reproductive tracts. I mean, really doing it. And they were thrilled and, and excited about it. And, and I just think it's a challenge. I, I mean, I, I saw Dr. Burns' statistics about the job potential in agriculture. It's going to get better. All my life I heard, you know, if we can make it to 1970, we can make a living farming. 70 came and it didn't happen. But it's here now. And when you go to the grocery in the future, thanks to this drought, you're going to find out. And, and I'll tell you this and get back to the subject. If Argentina and Brazil has a drought, we're in serious trouble. They're the opposite seasons than we are, and we're counting heavily on the corn crops from there to tide us over. Uh, most of the big ethanol plants in the Midwest have already shut down. The one in Hopkinsville has no debt. They're still operating. So we're facing some challenging times, and just to see those kids say, I got it when they were out on those farms, and we did a lot of things, and I could talk all day, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> I, just, I just want to give you one little frame of reference when he was talking about that. We went from conception to consumption. Right. So they went from the breeding all the way to the harvest. So those kids got a three-day experience of seeing all of that taking place. Mr. Solomon, I'd like to add one other thing, uh, going back to what Dr. Worthington said. It, it's a two-way street, mm -hmm. and the exciting thing is, uh, you know, we're, we're encouraging teachers to reach out to community members uh, for classroom resources uh, and also I, I've been so excited over the past few years at how many people have actually come to us and said what can we do for you and we're in Gallatin so we're not in a, in a, in a metro area but we have had people uh, from the, uh, the University of Tennessee Tech uh, here David Lipscomb that have brought in robotics, uh, Dr. Kevin Hargrove, who serves on our advisory council, uh, people from around the Middle Tennessee area, an hour and a half away, that are willing to come in if you ask them. Uh, and so whether it's someone to speak to your students, volunteer time in the classroom, that's, that's one of the things that we have encouraged our teachers to do. You have to reach out. I uh, heard Mr. Barty, Barty uh, this summer talk a little bit about what they're doing in Montgomery County. And then I had the opportunity to meet with our agriculture extension officer. He went and met with, with them. And then uh, Francis Gary and I met with, uh, with Trey Parker, our agriculture extension officer in Sumner County. So we are now looking at revamping what we're doing in Sumner County for 4-H to make it more engineering and science focused. So the opportunities are out there and the people are willing. It's just going out there and, and hitting the pavement getting them in the schools. And I think that um, we're hearing more and more, seems um, without exception across the panel, that the big key word is that relationship. It's about the relationships. Uh, to that end, to encourage relationships among this network, please let us know if you have any questions. Raise your hand and ask those of the panel. How do you get teacher buy-in when they've been teaching for 10 or 15 years at the same thing, you know, how do you get teacher buy-in to go STEM? To, to start thinking in a different way, start thinking critically uh, with critical questions. I really think that's a critical piece, um, as you well know. Um, the, the uniqueness of having the scientists in the classroom and working with Vanderbilt is that not only at that point are teachers 
able to see the relevance of their work, but more importantly, the impact of what they're doing. And so the change becomes in how they perceive their role, not only just as teachers, but then they become also facilitators of learning. And with Vanderbilt's help, and the questions that they have posed not only to the students, but then the teachers begin to think differently and how they go about solving problems. And I, and I think that's one of the critical pieces in, in actually making a partnership work. As a, as a business partner, I think the most um, astounding comment made from my perspective has been from Dr. Worthington, <coughs> that the school after hours concept, I don't know if because you're in a, a different industry that doesn't get to, to walk away at lunch and go to a chamber meeting or get involved in the lo local business chamber, that organization is thriving and wants to be involved. And that's what their focus is, is to make those connections. So those school after hours, that comment is brilliant from us. So bravo, I think that's great. So that local chamber of commerce, that director reaching out to them, they can make the connection. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause and thanks to our panel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next up, if you would welcome Mark Hill with the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce to explain the next part of our program. We do have you, by and large, organized by, uh, by counties. And there are some tables that don't have a designation. And what we're wanting to do in this breakout is encourage a quick table conversation, uh, perhaps 15 minutes, 20 minutes. We'll sort of circulate and see how the, how the conversation wraps up. But we want you to begin thinking about, OK, in our community, what are some ideas? You know, Based on what we heard from the speaker, from the panelists, how do we adapt some of these ideas or strategies to our community? Who do we need to get in contact with? You know, is it that local chamber? Is it a local elected official? Who's going to help pull this together? And what's a concrete next step? And then what we're going to do is, once everybody has a chance to have that conversation, we're going to do a report out. Let's go ahead and have our first report out from a community, and I'd like to ask the folks from Cheatham County. <laughs> One of the things we're doing in our community is we have uh, partnered with Trinity Barge Company, and I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but one of the things that's been uh, a blessing for us, I'll say it like that, is that when we partnered with them, uh, they basically were trying to get our students to walk out of high school and be able to walk into Trinity making, uh, try Trinity making $18 an hour. And so one of the things that they showed us was their curriculum. And what they do is they build barges and it's welding. And so their curriculum was very much aligned with the state curriculum and the CTE program. So we didn't mind using their curriculum because it hit all of the standards in the CTE. 
and I can't think if you're in a rural area, if you have a student that graduates from high school that started $18 an hour, that's a pretty good job if they don't want to go further. So that's one of the things we have uh, partnered with our community with. Um, so I, I'm doing a little commercial here, here, and I'm asking you to go online and take that survey that you are for. Uh, our focus academies and our STEM focus. Um, I said that sounds really cheesy, but I hope you don't mind, Mark, that I do that. Um, so if you'll go to Sumner County's website and take the survey as a community member, it'll ask if you have a student in Sumner County. Um, and of course, you're going to say no, but it'll, it'll ask you to look at those academies and whether you're in favor. But we're just hoping our community and our business partners uh, agree with us and support us that um, as we have to become leaner and leaner, uh, we realize the importance of becoming more strategic in the opportunities we provide for our students and that they're purposeful and meaningful. I think for us, our, our expansion is moving our externships found, and it, this will be modified from our high schools to our middle schools and our elementary schools, and we do have a plan for that on how to make that happen this next summer. Also, uh, one of our challenges is, is we are a very highly mobile district because we're so close to Fort Campbell. And so if you look in our brochure that we brought to you, you can see all of the things that we train our teachers on. We train them on integration. And, and we train them on collaboration, which is always not a natural experience for them. But also, we train on what we call natural fits and intentional hits. And they take their existing curriculum. We did not buy a stem in a box or anything like that. What we did was we took the existing curriculum that they have, the existing math curriculum and the existing science curriculum, and that's kindergarten through eighth grade and also in the ninth grade, because after the ninth grade, they tend to disperse. And that's another thing we're looking at is the academy approach. But what we did was we aligned those. And every time you do that, that is a, you, you said hard, Mike? Or hard mark. That is the most difficult thing to do is when you try to look at your curriculum and identify where are these natural fits where math and science align and then what do you have to go out here grab and bring back and make sure that you teach enough background that the students know what to do. And that's just part of it because now you've got to build a challenge on that. And so your challenges look very different than the normal classroom experience is. We are very excited about STEM education and we have been trained extensively by the experts in Clarkson Montgomery County, you really are. Um, but just last week we celebrated middle school science. Um, I did reach out into the community. We had 17 middle school science teachers that were adopted by local businesses, local doctors, um, the hospital there. I, got, I have received several uh, ideas from Clarksville Montgomery County. I just kind of piggyback off of them um, in that I love the idea about STEM on the farm. Um, I've already started conversations with uh, 4-H and UT Extension for that in the springtime. Um, and some of the we're ex we are excited there and our folks are not here today because they had a pull out grant writing. Uh, to do today and uh, they could not be here but said please take uh, notes on for us and that kind of thing. Um, challenges, we do have some challenges. We've got challenges with technology. We, we have challenges with teacher buy-in. Um, we have and training challenges. Uh, so I hear that across the state. Uh, but those challenges, I like a good challenge. So those things are then going to be problem solving we're doing STEM at our level then because we're problem solving to, to figure out what can we do to best um, educate our students for the future because the students that are in elementary and middle right now, their jobs have, some of their jobs have not even been invented yet. And it is very exciting to be a part of what they're going to experience in the future. The, the team here in Nashville consists of um, middle high school mostly and then our state representative and a student and some of the local colleges and businesses that work with us. But um, everyone pretty much knows that we have transformed all the high schools in Nashville and that, that is, we're into our third full year of that transformation and the results are really starting to pay off. Um, our high schools are completely staffed differently. The curriculum is, is delivered and created differently. Um, the, the roles of everyone in the building are completely different than they were three years ago, and the experience that the students are having is completely different than it was um, before. 
Uh, we are in the academy model. We are probably the largest city in the country that have gone wall to wall with over 16,000 students. Every student's in an academy in the 12 uh, zoned high schools. And uh, that's called the Academies of Nashville. And on a commercial, the National Career Academy Coalition are bringing their national conference here the first weekend in November. About a thousand people will be here from Guam, Hawaii, all over the country, Alaska, to see academies and to study academies and, and presentations from um, many school districts will be going on. You're welcome to attend that conference. Um, our next steps are transforming teaching and learning. We're in the midst of that. We've redesigned our schools. We have incredible business partnerships, over 175 partners working with us to make this redesign happen. But the challenge is transforming teaching and learning. Project-based instruction is what we're working for. That's why we're in our second year, second full year of a contract with the Buck Institute, which works with Singapore, works with the Los Angeles School District, and we're their third largest contract. Um, to change the way teachers look and look at curriculum and design and deliver that curriculum, giving students a voice and a choice in that curriculum, giving them a public audience, all built on common core standards with essential questions and need to know. So that's their eight components to that. Um, so project-based learning, we're doing a, a project, uh, same as, um, as Dr. Worthington said, we're not doing science fairs at the high school level this year, we're doing Project Expo, where the kids, no matter what their discipline are, who are working on projects can, can showcase in a public audience their projects, and they're not being judged, they're being scored and evaluated through rubrics and uh, experts in the field. The first emphasis that, that I want to, to give is on the idea of pre-K-6, because if if we don't have the interest in the science and the math and the engineering and the technology at our level, then it will be very difficult for the middle school and the high school students to have that. And Dr. Cheatham from, from Middle Tennessee State has heard that for about 10 years, so I appreciate his listening and, and being responsive to us, but it's really, really true. So I would ask, and you've heard it emphasized here today, but I think that's critical. Um, we have a very active relationship with the Chamber in Rutherford County. Both school systems do. The Chamber has been extremely helpful in helping us find uh, partnerships. That, that believe that we need to move education forward. We have a business education partnership. The Chamber will be sponsoring a Workforce Development Summit on the 30th of October. I'm very anxious for what will come out of that. I hope that there will be an increased awareness of what we need as far as STEM. Within our schools, we are seeing an emphasis on application, and that, of course, is one of the elements of Common Core, is that students not only have the content knowledge, but they are able to apply that. And for us, that's important because we're always talking about the why. I need to be able to explain why we are having certain courses in our schools, and teachers need to be able to explain why the students need to learn it, and the students need to know. So for us, application is extremely important, and that's what I'm hearing today is real application. I just want to say a couple of words from the Chamber's perspective um, in Murray County. I think we would all agree that atti changing attitudes um, is going to be the biggest challenge, and I think that's where the Chamber of Commerce looks forward to assisting the education system is not only helping uh, form those partnerships, but also helping uh, mold those attitudes toward what our school and what our businesses and what our community needs. Um, Robertson County has kind of taken a different approach uh, to STEM as far as how it got started. I really think that we've taken a bottom-up approach, which is actually one of our challenges. Um, the current things that we're doing, we had a principal who was gung-ho STEM at White House Heritage Elementary, and she said, hey, we're going to do this. And so she kind of got that buy-in, and we have a grades three through six program already up and running in their, I guess, kind of third year, second to third year um, of being a STEM school. And then in our high schools, our vocational director kind of said, hey, this fits right in with what I'm doing. And so he said, I'm not, I don't know what STEM is, but I think we should start something. So he started two different programs in our high schools, one at Springfield High School and one at Greenbar High School um, that are, he calls STEM academies. They probably look a little bit different than what everybody else calls an academy here, um, where students who have an interest in a STEM-related field can take uh, different courses um, in health related fields or in engineering. We have we hired some special personnel in the high schools for those two areas. Um, and they also have preferential seating in honors math and honors science classes. All of those initiatives started at 
the school level and someone just saying, hey, I think we need to do this. Um, Robertson County is currently in a director of schools change where you know, he's retiring. So uh, one of our challenges and needs is it to come from the top down. Um, one of our challenges is getting that teacher buy-in. Um, I was hired as part of Race to the Top funding to get it out in the middle schools. And while I go out to nine different school buildings every week, I'm still seeing pockets of where STEM is ready to take off and it's not countywide. So that's one of the things that we're kind of um, working with, I guess. Um, so we need a clear vision in our county. And I don't know, you know, with Common Core rollout, with a lot of other things that are on teachers, I think that's coming with the, those things. But there's so many things, just like um, what Cheatham County said, we're short on personnel of who can wear so many different hats at once and we have to put all our eggs in one place and right now it's just been common core common core common core so stem has kind of taken the bottom up approach with that we started our conversation with uh, one of our stratford scholars mr tate and as we were talking with him about what he was experiencing in his uh, program at stratford high school um, one of the other facilitators asked us what what is it that we in higher ed and in industry expected of him and so our whole conversation kind of uh, revolved around that uh, question and so we may not have gotten directly to what you all were asking but I want to pull from that discussion a couple of threads that I think are relevant. First is that um, the practical and applied experiences of STEM education are what are most meaningful to students and they're also the best way to engage industry in assisting with the education of students in these fields. Um, so that's first thing. It was the, the experiences that Mr. Tate talked about were the practical and experiential things that he did, like a stream survey, like making a comment at the Dyer Observatory, things like that. Those were meaningful and important to him. The second thing that came out of our discussion was that our new friends from Deloitte said, it's really great to have that academic content in math and science, but you also have to have those non-cognitive things that are important to being successful in work, like leadership abilities, presentation skills, communication skills, writing skills. These are things that are really important. So STEM education is really important, and yes, we need to improve on that, but we can't lose sight of the fact that these other things are really important. And they were mentioning that um, they look for people who have the uh, extracurricular experiences on their resume, not just um, high academic achievement. And we also have our Army Corps of Engineers representative said that when she finished as an engineer three years ago or four, five years ago, Oh, nine. Um, that the folks that she found from her cohort that were having trouble getting employed didn't have those additional non-cognitive leadership skills, communication skills, other things. So when we talk about STEM education, we are also really talking about career-ready uh, and college-ready skills. So we can't lose sight of the, the other aspects that are important. And in teacher ed, we call those other skills the teacher dispositions. What, is it, what are the other dispositions that you bring to the table besides your content knowledge that may make you successful. You know, and all of us are involved in very different activities. I myself do a lot of STEM professional development grants across the state, and I'm involved in our UTeach preparation programs for STEM majors in our universities. And so the, basically the challenges that we talked about were connections, like all of you have talked about. How do we make the connections? How do we keep the connections? And then with us in particular, how do you fund the connections? So especially, you know, most of us are funded through Race to the Top, and I think that we will be facing a lot of challenges when we get to the end of this grant period. So I can't say that we got a whole lot of solutions, but I think that it all raised some awareness between us that we're all kind of in this together and trying to reach out and help you all. And you know, we are all here hoping, hoping to serve you. And so I know that any of us would be delighted to have anyone come up and talk to us about what we are in particular are doing or how we can help you in the future that we don't already know right. about. So let, just let me close by, by also offering the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce's partnership to you as you, as you work on this. So we, we cover a 10 county region. We are very focused in Davidson County helping Metro schools, but we also partner with the surrounding counties. And if we can partner with the Robertson County Chamber with your event, or if there's something we can do to help with Murray County and their chamber, or the Summer County Chamber, we, we have those partners and we're happy to do that. So feel free to reach out to us. Mm -hmm.